I'd like to tell you about a problem that's very famous in some circles. I've seen it used as like an interview question for uh, admissions tests, but I've also seen just as a puzzle. I would like you to imagine, Brady, there are 100 light switches in front of you. At the moment, they're all off. The first person comes along and turns them all on. The second person turns every second light switch off. The third person deals with every third light switch. In that they don't just turn them on or off, if they're on they'll turn them off, and if they're off they'll turn them on. And the fourth person deals with every fourth light switch, the fifth person deals with every fifth light switch, I suspect you have the pattern. And that continues for a hundred people. That's the setup. The question which probably you've already arrived at, what happens at the end? Which light switches are on when a hundred people have done this thing? So the hundredth person just comes on and changes the state of the hundredth switch. I've said this before, Brady, you're a ple pleasure to work with. You're already thinking of the extremes of the problem and it's a really good approach to anything you're not sure about. You sort of jump to the extreme thing. The hundredth person is going to deal with every hundredth light switch, which in this particular sample is just the last one in our, in our lot. After a moment's thought, you might realise that anyone beyond the fiftieth switch is only going to have to deal with one switch because they're sort of the next multiple is, is out of our sample. But that, we've done the setup, so as ever in a good puzzle, if you want to actually go and think about it, now is a good time. Which light switches are on after 100 people have been through? Do you have any thoughts about the sort of numbers we're going to have to talk about in this problem? I, ob obviously, the further we go, the early lights are frozen in time. They're not going to get changed anymore. So after the fourth person's been through, are you, what, are you saying the first four lights yeah. are not going to change again? Yeah. If you could sort out what happens for the first 10 and get a picture of what's left on, then maybe you get a clue about what's happening. So I want to show you some of the answer. Spoiler coming. Here's the situation. All the lights are on now. First person has gone in and turned all the lights on. So 100 lights on. And person two comes in and turns every other light off because they were all on. Just because it gets harder to see what happens next, I'll do the third person and this pattern emerges, which is maybe not too difficult to arrive at after a bit of thought. But then as soon as you put the fourth person in, me personally, I feel slightly surprised about the pattern and I didn't expect sort of uh, a five and then, then a double gap and then a single gap. And and after that, the pattern maybe is very hard to predict. And we've got to go all, all through a hundred here. So that's my first spoiler. But what you said is nice because you know that after the first four people have gone through, those four are not going to change again. So I'm going to claim that maybe number one and number four are on. If I go one more, and this is the last spoiler I'm going to give before we give away, five has gone off and five is never going to change again. But the pattern now is really even quite hard to spot. I think if you look long enough, you can see something repeating, but the, re the repeat of the pattern is getting longer each time. And I sort of dread to try and predict what happens by this method if I go much further. So we should maybe generalise and figure out what is going to make a light switch turn on or off and how many times and is it going to be off or on by the end. Every time I've posed this problem at people, and I'd, I'd, I'm curious to know if you're the same or if anyone watching is the same, people have mentioned a certain type of number to me that seems to be important, which are prime numbers. Do they feel like they have any bearing on this? <laughs> I wouldn't have thought so. Well, the interesting thing about it is that if a number is switched, it's because the person going in has their, their number is a factor of that number. So in that sense, factors or devices are going to be important here. It's a slightly dead end here. So if you imagine a prime like uh, the number five, we've already established from a little example here, the number five is off and it's never going to get changed again. So maybe we could conjecture that primes are going to be off. And indeed, if you look at earlier primes, two and three are indeed off. And the rest we're not sure about, but we could, for example, think of the number seven. Let me just write down a fact you know about seven. Those are the factors of seven. Because it's prime, it only has two factors. If it only has two factors, only two people are going to switch that switch. The first person and the seventh person. Therefore, I think it's not a million miles away for anyone to leap to the conclusion that it will be off because it's been turned off on by the first person and then off by the seventh. And in fact, any prime is going to do that because it only gets touched twice. So primes are always off. Yes, but if we look at the number six, for example, and I could, I could do it on the demo, but maybe it's easier to think about how we could do it. And I'm going to write this down. Who's going, to, uh, who's going to hit number six? Well, this is obvious, but I can also write it in another way. And I think what I've kind of pointed out the long way around is that six has four factors or four devices. 
I'm going to ask you to make the leap. If, if it's going to get hit by person one, because that's a factor, person two, person three, and person six, what will happen by the end for number six? So one turns it on, yep. two turns it off, yep. three turns it on, yep. six turns it off. Yeah. So if it has an even number of factors, it ends up off. If it has an even number of divisors, yeah. it ends up off. I, I think you just said the same thing twice using two different words that people use for the same thing. Divisors, factors, I think maybe uh, US and UK di differ. Divide, in fact, about how they uh, they choose. But factors of divisors, I mean the numbers that divide exactly into another. And you know, you're right, six ends up off. And if you want to check, let, let's do the uh, experiment. Six person's gone in, number six is off. And our conjecture so far that six should be off is correct. And you made it even more general, an even number of factors and the light will be off by the end. Okay, let me give you another bonus fact, which maybe is obvious. Factors come in pairs. Right. So does every number have an even number of... No, it doesn't, because we see that four is on. Hang on. Yeah, I'm really glad you've, you've said the word hang on here. This should be the mathematical moment, because factors come in pairs. Oh, but they can be duplicate pairs, Ooh, can't they? When, when would that happen? Like two times two for ah. four. Yeah. So if I wrote down four, right, I could write it down as one times four. I could also write it as two times two, but the duplication here has meant there are actually only three factors. Good, we're making progress. We've established why I think number four is left on. You're doing so well so far. What would be the next light that stays on? A square number. Do you want to pick your favourite square that's not been done? Well, nine. Nine is the next one, should we check it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> having a, a, an ability to experiment like this, by the way, is underrated, I think, in mathematics. A lot of people think you should be doing it all in your head, but just experimenting and testing your conjectures is nice. So let's do it. Seven. Seven is off. Eight. And nine is already off. So when I put the ninth person in, lo and behold, nine is on. I um, mean, if we check it, right, nine, you can write it as one times nine. How else can you write it? Well, it's not two times anything, but it is three times three, and that's it. In fact, if you're checking factors, you only ever need to check up to the square root of a number before you should probably stop wasting your time and checking anymore. And how many factors? Well, one, two, three. Conjecture so far? Well, squares odd, are looking good. Squares, odd numbers. Numbers with an odd number of factors. Anything that has a times itself, unless it does it twice, unless it has two two numbers that can well, do it. We, we, already you've kind of talked yourself into the square numbers are apparently going to be on because of the duplication. Yeah. But now you're worried about whether that happens twice if it's going to change it. So maybe we should try an example. <sighs> can you think of an answer? A square of a square? Uh, I'm asking you to do so much while you're holding the camera. Yeah. Uh, four is square, and you could square four to get uh, still a relatively low number. Uh, four times four. So we should check 16. Let's check 16. Do you, do you want to try on paper before we actually yeah, do the Yeah, let's try on paper. Okay, so 16. 1 times 16. Nice, Brady. Keep going. 4 times 4. Do you want to... Let's, oh, let's oh, go. Two, 2 times 8. Nice, because if we if we go up in a sort of nice pattern, we'll know when we've got them all. 3 times I don't think is going to work. Mm. And 4 times 4. First things first, is it a square? Yes. It's got this duplicated. So were you expecting to see more here? No, but I don't know whether the fact that you can expand that to 2 times 2 times 2 means anything. Probably not. Well, what we should be doing here is bearing in mind uh, something which sounds important called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic says that every number has a unique prime factor decomposition. So we're writing down factors, not prime factors. Uh, and there's more than one way of writing them down, which is kind of what we're using. But every number has a unique way of writing it in primes. And you probably know that. And maybe that's going to help us because that's kind of to do with what you're pointing out here, that you could expand the 8 into 2 times 2 times 2. So let's just do the prime factor decomposition of 16. Uh, it's just 2 to the 4. If you break all these down to primes, you're just left with that. 9 is 3 squared. If we jump, say, to let's do 24. Not a square number. Let's see what it decomposes as. Well, let's just do the, the old-fashioned way. 1 times 24, 2 times 12, 3 times 8, 4 times 6, and then we're done. Interestingly, they're coming in pairs still. And if you write it as a prime factor decomposition, it's going to be 2 times 12, but 12 is 2 times 6, and 6 is 2 times 3, so it's that, and I would write it as 2 cubed times 3. So it's worth, I think, whenever you're working with a problem that has factors involved, noting the difference between factors or divisors and prime factors. And I think you've already got to the heart of this, and I, I guarantee some people are watching this video and they're like, we've got there straight away, because if you spot the one thing which you have already spotted, this becomes a number theory question. You said it, the numbers with an odd number of factors are going to be on, and the ones with an even number are going to be off. So it becomes which numbers have an odd number of factors. We've already established by experimenting that squares appear to, but is it only them? And do some squares not? Well, we've checked the 16. Let me give one spoiler. The only numbers that have an odd number of factors are the squares. 
which I think we should dive into to finish this video. But if that's true, can you predict what lights are going to be on at the end of our story? Well, we did 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, 25, 36. Should we just animate it and see? Yeah. I mean, there's two things to watch out for, which ones turn on by the end, and the patterns we get along the way, which uh, even if you've done this problem before, maybe you haven't seen this before, and it's quite, it's quite pleasing. So let's just animate and, and see how that goes. 16, 25 is on, 36 is on. 49 is looking good, Brady. 64, 81, and 100. Congratulations. Even though I don't think you said it, you told me the equivalent statement, which is the numbers with an odd number of factors are on. And this surprises some people. The square numbers. I would never have guessed that at the start. No, and a lot of people immediately say this problem. They're like, oh, it's going to be to do with the primes, which is why I mentioned that earlier, uh, which I think is why people like it as an interview star question, because it has that slightly unexpected squares are something to do with factors, uh, but they are. And it's quite a nice profound number theory fact that I haven't proved yet. It is uh, only the squares that have an odd number of factors. And maybe we should prove that. Are you up for that? Yeah, because I want to figure out whether or not this was a complete red herring, the fundamental theorem of... Yeah, well, now we've established that because of the on and off nature, it's, you'd need an odd number of factors for it to stay on. And, crucially, all factors come in pairs, because that's what factors do. <laughs> and you spotted the crucial thing is that yeah, that only breaks down when you have a duplication, and that's why the count changes. But let's prove it a little bit more formally, and uh, well, we're trying to give ourselves space down here. Do you want more paper? I don't think we need more paper, Brady. All right. Let's do it with 24 as an example. Uh, so 24 is 2 cubed times 3. That's its prime decomposition, and that's almost always a good place to start. Let me point out how you'd figure from that how to count the factors. Now we've done it, and there aren't very many, but if this was a huge number, I don't think I'd want to list them by hand. So if this is its prime factor decomposition, a factor must be some subset of numbers in that, otherwise it wouldn't multiply it together. So I could, for example, pull out 2. A 2 is in there. Agreed? I could pull out two of the twos, and I could go up to three of the twos, but if I tried to put four twos, it's not in here, so it's not a subset. And I could pull out a two with a three, or I could pull out the three on its own. And then, have we done them all? One, two, three, four, five. I think there should be a few more factors. What have I missed? Well, I could pull out two squared with the three. I could pull out two cubed with the three. And there's got to be a better way to count this. So what have I've, I've, I've got two times three, two squared with the three, two cubed times the three. That's the full one. What have I missed? There should be eight. I'm thinking there are eight over here, and I'm wondering if it's obvious. So the, the number, what about the number itself and one? Well, that's, that's there, the number oh, itself, uh, but one. you're right. The one is the hard one to spot because it's kind of the weird subset of this. And so here's what's happening. I'm choosing some of the numbers in the list to make a factor. And actually, the only way I can do it is, is controlled by the power here. There's actually a power one here that's kind of invisible. And I can go, I could do any of the numbers up to three, including zero. So to make this a bit more obvious, I could have 2 to the 0, I could have 2 to the 1, I could have 2 to the 2, and I could have 2 to the 3 in the mix, and I could have 3 to the 0, or 3 to the 1 in the mix. And any combination gives me one of the factors. So that's it. It's just how many options do I have for that, which is always going to be one more than that number, and how many options do I have for that. So if we're going to generalise, I'd like a piece of paper. Told you. Now we've got an appropriately fresh piece of paper to generalise on. I'm going to write down, uh, for some number n, you can always write it as a product of primes. Let's call them P1 and P2 and P3 uh, and so on. What should we go up to? PK? Are you happy with that so far? And to condense the notation, like some of these primes might be the same. So let's, you can put them as a power. So let's call this uh, C1, C2. And these are the indices of the powers in CK. That, every number can be written like that. Some of these don't exist, but we just pointed out on the previous page that it's the number of options you have for each prime that controls it. So we had three there before, but we had four options for the two. It's two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, two to the three. So it's C1 plus one options for how many of that prime to include. But then completely separately, there's the options here. So you can multiply, like whatever you do there, you can do a different option here. So I've got C2 plus one, C3 plus one, all the way to CK plus one. And the number of factors is well defined as this. It's the product of the powers of the prime factors plus one. Which means we are almost within grasp of proving your conjecture earlier, which is that it's only the squares which have an odd number. So the square numbers will have one integer which multiplies by itself to give you that number. That's the definition of a square, which means when you look at its prime factors, they will always come in duplicates. There will always be a prime squared, or to the power of four, it will be an even power. Otherwise you couldn't split it in half. Which means all of these numbers, are even in a square, which means if you add one to them all, 
for a square number all odd. All of these will be odd, which means the product of them all is odd. And we can also see kind of the reverse. If any one of them was odd originally at the top, then adding one to it would make it even, and we would actually just get an even number here, which is why you normally get an even number. Factors come in pairs, it only takes one of them to break it because a product of anything with an even number is also even. The only time they end up all odd is if you had a square to start with, and we're done. The answer to the puzzle of the light switches is it's the squares that stay on. Uh, there are lots of other questions you could ask if you want to explore, which is how many times does each switch get switched? And that is just its number of factors. Uh, do some get switched? Uh, which light switch is gonna break first if you repeatedly have fun with this? And that's less obvious because it's asking which numbers have lots of factors. And I don't think we have a very good intuition about this. We know that primes don't have many factors, but some factors, some numbers have lots of factors. And so actually this, uh, this puzzle hinges on a really important sequence called tau or sigma, is important enough to have a name, which is the number of divisors of a number. And if you look it up on the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, it has the name A000005. It's very early. The naming of the integer sequences, uh, or the, the labeling, I don't quite understand, but it, however you name it, you've got to attach importance to the first ones even though the first one is something to do with groups, feels profound, and the rest of them I'm not quite sure I recognize. However, number five is the sequence of the numbers of divisors of a number. And if you look at the ones that have high number of divisors, it's numbers like 60. 60 is the first one to have 12 factors, which we could check by doing this if you wanted to. Uh, so six is 60 the switch that gets switched the most in the first 100? There are others with 12 factors, but it's the first one to get switched 12 times. Um, it's what they call a highly composite number. It's the first time that its number of factors beats all the ones before it. Um, and I looked briefly up to this, and if you carried on to, say, 200 light switches, the number 180 gets nobbled <laughs> more than often than the others, and you start to recognize those numbers as the ones we use to divide things which are helpful to have fractions for, like portions of a circle. You won't be surprised to know that another highly composite number is 360. So we measure time in 60s, we measure angles in 360s. It's partly because of the number of factors here. I'm glad you found a route to the, the nub of the problem here, which is only the square numbers have an odd number of factors, and that feels like a pleasing outcome to a potentially contrived puzzle. If you enjoyed that video, well, you're gonna love all the courses, quizzes, and puzzles on Brilliant. Here's the Leaning Tower of Lyra, also known as the Block Stacking Problem. It's part of their superb Calculus in a Nutshell course. It's great, and here's where Brilliant really shines. It's super interactive. You can really get hands-on with this stuff. There are thousands of lessons and courses on Brilliant, and new ones are being added all the time, from beginner to advanced mathematics, computer science, AI, neural networks. This is a treat beyond compare for all level of learners. To check out Brilliant yourself, maybe give it as a gift for the learner in your life, go to brilliant.org slash number file. That URL, which is also in the description, can get you a discount on their premium subscription, and there's also a 30-day free trial. Thanks, Brilliant, for supporting Numberphile and making such cool stuff on the internet.